I think it was because, uh, we're, we're talking about two different things here, though. Um, physically, with the sword fight, it was because Aragon was very, very tired from the battle. If Aragon had been well-rested, Murtag wouldn't have stood a chance. But later on in the fight, when they go into sort of a contest of magical strength, Murtag overpowers him with a spell, or you know, is able to outlast him with a spell. And that is something Murtag still would have been able to do, even if Aragon was well-rested. And if you're asking me why, I say Brissinger. <laughs> um, Sephira, there's, she's already met Gladier, and there are two other male dragons. You're probably not going to answer this, but does she have any feelings for the other two? Well, she hasn't really met them aside from Thorn. Yeah, um, who she only met in the middle of a battle, so... Right. <laughs> not a good start off to... No, not a first date, good first date. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, well, we shed blood together. I mean, you were trying to kill me, but let's get together anyway. Uh, no. Uh, I'd say that at, at the moment, uh, she really doesn't... I think her feelings toward Thorn are probably a little more ambivalent than her feelings toward Shrukin, Galbatorix's dragon, who she probably regards as the enemy at this point, yeah. and rightly so. And Thorn, she's probably a little bit more ambivalent toward because, of course, Thorn has been forced to serve. Has not ch he, he never chose to serve Galbatorix, and neither did Murtag, actually. So you're saying, in essence, they aren't really evil? No, they're not, actually. Um, I mean, I think Murtag maybe that he enjoys doing what he's doing a little bit more than he ought to. <laughs> but, I mean, he never chose to serve Mur Galbatorx. He never went to him and said, you know, I want to serve you, I want to fight by your side, I want to bring Aragon to you. Voice, but, but he ran away. But he ran away. He ran away. So, I, so that's why I think Sephira's feelings are probably slightly mixed with regard to Thorn. If somebody else finds out somebody's true name mm -hmm. and somebody's already controlling that person, can the other person take control somehow? Wait a minute, say that again? Okay, like, <laughs> if one person already knows somebody's true name and right. they're controlling them. Right. But what if somebody else finds out that true name that as well? True name, could they somehow? Yeah, um, again, there's a lot more about true names in Brissinger. There's a lot in Brissinger, as I keep saying. Um, but yes, if, if you know the true name of someone, you can use that true name to control them. If anyone else knows the true name, they can use it as well. So it would be like having two, two masters, if you will, controlling the same person. Um, which actually, I suppose, uh, could even be used as a defense. You know, like if you knew that your enemy had learned your true name and you had any amount of free will, you could tell your true name to someone you trusted and they could use that to sort of wrestle control of you back from your enemy. Does Martag know his true name? No comment. Um, I've seen a lot of books, and well, with most authors, they use their books as a way to ex um, uh, show their personal beliefs to the world. Do you have anything in like Eldest or Aragon that you personally believe that you like to put in the book? So you can just say, I think people would be, I think people would be surprised by how much um, I don't share the beliefs of my characters in many ways. Uh, for example, um, when in actually no, I'm not going to give specific examples because that would start. <laughs> pinning me down, but no, my characters believe what they believe for very good reasons from their own histories and their own experiences. And I'm not trying to tell people what to believe or, you know, what to do or what they shouldn't do. I'm just trying to show what people do believe. Uh, and again, I think Brissinger is going to add a lot more to this discussion because you know, in Eldest we had Aragon going to the Elves, for example. We had a lot of from the Elves about what they do or don't believe. Um, and in Brissinger, we get to see a few other viewpoints as well. So I think and it'll w round it out a little bit more. You said that Aragon meets a god in Brissinger. Is there one god or are there more? Like in Greek mythology? That's a deep question. That's a deep question. And again, I just can't say a, say a thing about it. <laughs> know what I would love to see? A couple chapters from Galbatorix's point of view. Be Ooh, you know, I never right. thought about doing that. That, yeah, Actually, that would be really fun to write. I have to admit, I love writing villains. Villains are so much fun to write, and they're fun to read about. Uh, I mean, I would probably, with Galbatorix, enjoy writing it so much I'd have to write a book. I mean, because the thing most people don't realize about Galbatorix is, sure, he's mad, sure, he's insane, sure, he's evil, but he's smart. And you know what? Dosh Garnet, he enjoys doing what he does. <laughs> no, I mean, really, he really enjoys it. He's not one of those villains who is, you know, reluctant or, or sort of forced into it and is angry all the time. Well, he gets angry 
plenty of the time. But no, he really enjoys doing what he's doing, and he thinks he's doing the right thing in many cases. But um, no, writing a point of view from Galbatorx would be awfully fun. Well, because I've noticed you never really, I mean, they talk about him all the time. That's right. But you never really see him. Yeah, Galbatorx never... is sort of the big, uh, you know, the big unseen in the closet. Well, it kind of reminds me of like Sauron and Lord of the Rings. You never actually see him. I mean, there's the eye. Well, it's one of the things that comes from, uh, there's a famous movie called The Third Man by Orson, uh, starring Orson Welles. And I don't know if you guys have ever seen it. No. Uh, it's a great noir film set right after World War II, and it's got a really weird soundtrack by a zither. Uh, great movie, but for the first two-thirds of the movie or so, everyone is talking about this guy who's died, Harry Lyme, and he's played by Orson Welles. Everyone talks about him. Everyone talks about him. You never see him until at one point in the movie, the guy you thought was dead, I'm ruining the movie for you here, but I, it's, it's worth it. <laughs> Steps out of the shadows, and he's alive, and it's Orson Welles. And because everyone's been talking about him for the whole movie, when you finally see him, you, you really pay attention to him. You know, he takes on a lot more importance in the story. In fact, when you ask most people who's the star of the movie, they say Orson Welles, but he's not. You only see him near the end of the movie, but he's the most important character in the movie. And uh, I think Galbatorx is somewhat like that. You know, everyone's talking about him, but we haven't seen him yet. J.K. Rowling said that even though after she, she's done writing Harry Potter, she's going to write an eight or ninth book. Um, just details about Harry Potter, things that um, fans ask all the time, mm -hmm. she's going to address. When you're finished with the cycle, do you plan on doing the same? My main interest in this is this telling the story. And I have a lot of extra things that um, fans ask all the time, mm -hmm. she's going to address. When you're finished with the cycle, do you plan on doing the same? My main interest in this is this telling the story. And I have a lot of extra material, but I'm not sure how interesting it is to, you know, the casual reader, even the not-so-casual reader. Uh, so, no, I mean, when I finish, I'm going to write a new story. It may, it, and it won't be set in Allegasia, at least probably not the next one. I do have a fifth book planned for Allegasia, but <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> but it's not something I plan to do at any time soon. So uh, I've laid the groundwork for it. In fact, I've laid hints throughout the story for it. Um, but I'm not saying where and I'm not saying how. Uh, but that is, that is something I plan to do eventually, is maybe another book in Allegasia, but that's, that's long term. For now, that I'm going to write a fourth, or, I mean, I'm going to finish the series, and then I'm going to write something completely different. Any idea on what you plan on writing after Aragon? I mean, yes, I've got three or four books backed up. Um, and a couple of different genres, so it's just going to depend when I finish, Elder, finish the series what I feel like tackling next. One's science fiction, one's fantasy, one's sort of post-apocalyptic, uh, noir, thriller. Uh, I got a couple of different ideas. So. The movie. What's, <laughs> we got to talk about the movie. I mean, they, the portrayal of the, that uh, Fox did is so much different from yours. Did, were you resentful for them against them for changing so many things? Oh no, I wasn't resentful at all. I was happy that a movie got made. Any movie, the odds of, uh, of that even happening are so small. It's uh, really, really a, a fun thing that it actually did. I mean, the thing is, is when you sell a book to a movie studio, uh, it's theirs to do with as they please, and the movie reflects the vision of the story that the studio had at the time. And my vision of the story is. You know, it's in the books, and it's still in the books, and people who want to see that uh, can read the books. So I probably would have made a different movie, but, um, you know, I'm glad there's a movie at all. And it, I think it brought a lot of new, it introduced a lot of readers to the series that hadn't read it before, and that, um, I think that's a good thing. How do you feel about the video games? You know, it's funny you ask about the video games. Um, I love playing computer games. I mean, I love playing computer <laughs> games. I have to make a conscious effort not to play them, or I won't write a, a single word. Um, especially things that explode on the screen. Anyway, um, I played the Xbox 360 version of the Aragon game, and I played it start to finish in one sitting with one of my friends. And we got every single secret. We played it on the hardest setting. We, we did everything. I mean, by the time we, I got, I got a blister on my thumb <laughs> from pushing the controls around.